Hi, I'm Earl Jones at Abasala. My wife Hilda and I started this uh, little project about 20 some years ago. We bought a bare piece of land, much like on our neighbor's property today. And we planted the, the first vines here in 1995. Uh, as we learned from our planting, neither of us had a background in viticulture or enology. And so as we learned, we began to plant more and we became very particular about where we planted it. What did well on a southern hillside where it gets very warm didn't do well on the north side of a hill. So we took advantage of that to selectively plant the things that we thought would do well. And they have, they've done very well in their own respective little plots of land. And that's what you see here. Some of these little plots are relatively tiny but that enables us to produce several different varieties, uh, grow several different kind of grapes, I should say, and then make those into wine here. And now I've been impressed because um, I first became familiar with your wines about, mm, I want to say 10, 12 years ago. And you were doing things in Oregon that other people were not doing, like dolcettos and that sort of a thing. Can you tell me why did you want to do these interesting varietals? Well, we came here with the intent of only growing Tempranillo. And we planted some other things that we thought would fit this climate. Uh, they did, and so we began to produce them. Dolcetto was one of those. Uh, Albarino was one of those. Uh, Grenache was one of those. Uh, Malbec was one of those. Viognier was one of those, and on down the list. Now, we don't produce Pinot Noir. We believe we're much too warm for that. Uh, you know, we don't produce Cabernet Sauvignon. We don't think we can make a good Cabernet here. So that's how we made our decisions. What worked well, we produced. What didn't work, we don't. So you obviously went with a terroir of what you had to yeah, work with we, and, and the microclimates. <laughs> yes, we are. We're very much terroirist, I guess you could say. Yeah, that suits, that's pretty well nails this. As I was saying, we have become terroirist and we had a real bonus. We came here because of the climate. But then we found that we were astride a fault line. In other words, it bisects our vineyard into almost halves. Part of it has this kind of soil base made from round rocks, river rocks. And to the south of it is a very different soil uh, that made from disintegrated boulders. So the, uh, our soils couldn't be more different, are more different in age. Uh, some two or three hundred million years older on this side than on that side. So this just added another element of terroir into our climate equation so that we could grow something in a warm climate that had those kind of boulders, I mean those kind of cobble, or something in a warm climate that had this kind of boulder material as its parent rock. Well, so now you said when you came here, you weren't really familiar with the, the whole viticultural thing. So how long did it take you to figure out? I mean, you obviously had to consult some people about, about different soils and rocks and everything. <laughs> well, that's really not true. Uh, the federal government, through the uh, Coast and Geodetic Survey, simply put it in our hands. While we were uh, planting our first grapes, uh, the Menlo Park branch of the, uh, the geodetic survey came to Oregon and were surveying what's called the Roseburg Quadrangle. Now all of this material you see on the slide is a credit to these guys, Ray Wells and his team. And I wish they'd have published it a few years earlier. They actually published it in 2001 We'd already had six years experience by then. I could have benefited from it a little earlier. <laughs> but no one knew that this fault line was here. No one knew of all of this bizarre soil differences. Part of our story here that is really interesting is we have a special relationship with our neighbor, the wildlife safari. Yeah, and that for, since 1997, that's 19 years, we've been giving them hay. We bail it, the, the guy that bails it donates his time and we give it to the safari for food and for bedding for the animals. They turn around and give us back the elephant poo, and we compost with that, which makes a very interesting soil amendment, and we use that on the blocks that appear to need it. 
Uh, yeah. how, how many people use elephant uh, dung as a composting base? It's pretty rare. We're pressing. So this is wine coming straight out of the press cake. It's just lightly pressed right now. Yes, I've actually already uh, turned off the press, so it's just draining out. I'll be making a press cut here in just a second. This is our Tempranillo Clone 13 off of Esperanza Block. Pretty typical cluster. Garnacha, Spanish grape. Most people think about, you know, uh, out here and they think in terms of climate and they want to put, a, put us somewhere in the south of Europe. But uh, we're actually fairly far up in Europe. Most of the, of southern Italy, all of southern Spain uh, is like northern California. And, and then California's wine growing regions are like in North Africa. It's just different oceans and different climate circumstances that enable wine growing in different locations. See, when we're picking, we make a note that, that this is Grand West Garnacha, uh, row 26 through 23, lower part of the row. We're looking for little subtle differences that there might be, so we could, if, if, if we ever changed that block, we would know what we wanted to put in the change. Without keeping records like this, uh, grafting over or planting new blocks becomes guesswork. And we pay very close attention and have for those early years here. That's why we have all those little blocks out there today. How often do you find yourself changing um, different types of varietals and different blocks? A little less often than we change hats, but we change. Uh, like this year, we grafted over four acres to something new. And we got there by these little note cards. We're going into the fermentation room. This is the way it works. This is Malbec from East Hill that's now been in here, looks like about 14 days. And there's notes every time we do anything to it. So those are notes from just 14 days? Yeah, that's the notes from 14 days of winemaking decisions we've made where uh, to pump over, to punch down. This is our second year barrel cellar. So the wines that need more than one year of maturing, we bring them up here for their second year of what we call élevage. We'll walk back through here. I was the winemaker for the first 10 years, for in other words, about half of our existence. And then I hired someone to take my place. You know, part of the reason I had to do that is that the grapes we wanted to grow, there were no one around here making into wine. There was no Tempranillo planted. So who was I going to ask to share their expertise? <laughs> Zero. We just took a little tour at the winery with Earl. This is a beautiful place. So Alvarino is a dry, crisp white wine. It's most similar to a Sauvignon Blanc. It is a Spanish varietal. Navicella is famous for it. We, it is our most awarded wine this year. It's received a lot of gold medals. And Avicella is the first plantings in the U.S. So on the south side of the hill, you'll find the first Alvarino in the U.S. That's lovely. Mm -hmm. All right, so up next is Malbec. So this year, our 2013 vintage of Malbec received a score of 91 points from Wine Enthusiast magazine. Oh. Very beautiful oh, Malbec. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> so Avicella was also the first plantings of Malbec in the unit in um, Oregon. Wow, that is lovely. It's a very beautiful wine. So Avicella means to plant a vine or stick. It's an old Spanish word that Earl found when he was researching in Spain and he found it in a dictionary and he opened the dictionary and saw abacella. It means exactly what we do. We like grapes. It comes from the root abacellar and it started with an A and it was Spanish. So he said he had the trifecta of a name. It sticks. It sticks. <laughs>